Hi, I'm Jim Paxson. Tonight, we'll take you along on an action-packed sunrise dove hunt near Yuma. We'll update you on the comeback of black-tail prairie dogs. Find out how you can help keep access to our public lands open for everyone. And if you're looking for a new and interesting pet, we might just have the critter for you. All that and more coming up on Arizona Wildlife Views. Arizona Wildlife Views is brought to you by the sale of hunting and fishing licenses and the Heritage Fund, lottery dollars working for wildlife. Some projects made possible by the Sport Fish and Wildlife Restoration Fund. Hello and welcome to our show. The Sonoran Desert is really beautiful and it's home to hundreds of wildlife species. But without enough water, life out here can be really hard. In our first story tonight, we'll take you to Southern Arizona where Game and Fish is providing a new source of water for wildlife. There's a simple truth in nature. Where there's water, there's wildlife. But sometimes wildlife has a hard time finding water, especially during drought and almost always in the desert. You know, this is the Sonora Desert and, uh, you know, it's hot and dry, uh, really hot and dry during the summer. Here's another simple truth. Where water's running out, the Arizona Game and Fish Department is often digging in. Well, we're in the beginning stages of a wildlife water development. Mark Freeberg is the wildlife manager for this swath of Sonoran Desert about 50 miles southwest of Tucson. We're in Game Management Unit 36C. Um, it goes all the way from three points to uh, the border, boundaried by 286, Highway 286 on the uh, east and the Babakivri Mountains on the west. It's mule deer country, but when Freeberg surveyed the area, he didn't find much water for deer to drink. That's why he requested this project. What it is is a rain catchment. Some of the units, uh, they have you know, anywhere from six to 10, even in the Yuma region, I think they have over 100 um, wildlife catchments in them. And, and this unit actually has one, and this will be the second one. Six and a quarter. Um, that just kind of speaks for the, the need of, of water in the unit. So it is about time. The folks doing the work are from the development branch of Arizona Game and Fish. Today, they're getting some help from the Arizona chapter of the Safari Club and the Santa Rita Landscaping Company. We're basically providing some of the equipment service and the operators to, to, to dig the holes for the tanks and uh, prep, prep the site. I'm a user of wildlife, I'm a watcher of wildlife, and so uh, to be able to, to give back to wildlife is a great thing. Put in this water catchment, uh, that's our main goal. Toby McMillan is the field crew supervisor and a new kid on the block. Yeah, see right there is 9-6. It's my first yeah. one. But his crew has more than 60 years of experience. Almost 10 years. Just about 20 years. 34 years. <laughs> and they almost work like a machine, you know, from one step to the next. So, you know, I get to learn a little bit from them about how this is all goes together. <laughs> Arizona Game and Fish has been building water developments for wildlife since 1946. Yeah, in the 50s they started off, they were mainly cement vaults. They worked very well, but they didn't have the capacity. One of the biggest vaults is only 2,500 gallons. They would go dry and we were hauling water to them every year. The department currently maintains about 1,000 catchments all across the state. We had a fiberglass system, which were fiberglass ring tanks, and this is the latest and greatest design now is polyethylene tanks. The latest water catchments are designed to be low maintenance and to last about 50 years. But the biggest improvement is capacity. With this system, like we have four 2,500 gallon tanks, that's 10,000 gallons. If they fill up, they will last a long time. We leave on Tuesday, we load everything up on trailers, get all the equipment out here, all of our supplies, and 
We'll set tanks and we'll set the drinker. We spend eight days out here, uh, 10 hour days. You gotta love the camp. It's a job for an outdoorsman, for sure. I love uh, working for wildlife. I love doing what I'm doing for the wildlife. Um, I love being out in the field. I mean, I just love being camped out, working outside. <laughs> This, you know, I, I get to live, live and work in the woods, you know. Um, this is my office and, and that's what I prefer. Yeah, if you're an outdoorsman, this is a great, great job. The development crew connects the four 2,500 gallon tanks to the drinker with three inch PVC pipe. The project will cost about $43,000. About half of the cost is covered by revenue from special hunting tags that are sold at auction. $10,000 was donated by the Freeport McMoran Mining Company. The rest comes from a federal excise tax on the sale of guns and ammo. A metal apron that will collect rainwater is installed above the tanks. We put a fence around it, usually 150 by 150 steel rail fence. It's a wildlife friendly fence and uh, keep burrows and cattle out. Our job is basically wildlife habitat improvement. I mean, um, in Arizona, the thing lacking is water. The Bighorn Sheep Society has a, a saying, Sanagua Mortis, without water, death. And it, it's so true, especially in this state. And so that's, it's really, satisfying to get done with a project um, and uh, know that there's a, a reliable source of water for the animals. We got an apron that collects the rainwater that's covering the tanks, that protects the tanks in a way too. So the rain falls on the apron, it goes down in the gutter, goes through pipelines into the tanks. In the bottom of the tanks there's a pipeline that goes to the trough and the wildlife can get their drinks out of the trough. The job isn't finished until the crew cleans up its campsite and makes sure no tracks are left behind. Uh, the most satisfying aspect is probably when you're done with it, you know you did something for wildlife and when you see deer start using it, and it's a great feeling. Building a water catchment is a lot of hard work, but the payoff is worth it because where there's water, there's wildlife. They show up before sunup. You know, there's 10 dove right there, there's 10 dove over there. Like kids on Christmas morning, they've been waiting for this all year. It just gets you giddy. <laughs> September 1st is opening day of dove season. And in Yuma, Arizona, that's a pretty big deal. It's like Disneyland for us, you know, it's our busiest hunting season of the year. If they're a hunter, um, I would say a lot of excitement and apprehension, you know, what's going to be like, um, you know, are there going to be a lot of birds, am I going to find the right spot? If you don't know anything about it, you still feel the buzz and the energy in the community, but you're not quite sure why. This agricultural community on the Colorado River is a dove hunter's paradise, and it's the place to be on opening day. We're the dove hunting capital of the United States. It's always a good time. This is the third year we come out, and uh, yeah, we'll be coming out here as long as they keep inviting us. It's a huge economic boost for the community. This is my 33rd year in a row. I haven't missed an opening day. It's really fun. People come here from all across Arizona, California, and beyond. And we come with a group of about 20, 30 people out here, so it's just been a kind of a tradition to come out. My daughter Emily looks forward to it uh, every year, so it's a real fun weekend for us. So, For many, it's a family tradition that often starts at Sprague Sports, also known as Dove Central. Yeah, this, this is Dove Central. That's, that's what we advertise and that's what we are. This is where hunters stock up on gear and ammo, buy a hunting license, or grab a souvenir t-shirt. I had to talk to a guy today who's been coming down here for 56 years. It's an event, it really is. It's a tradition too. 
It's a carnival-like atmosphere with plenty of chances to win prizes and raise money for a good cause. Winner, 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 chicken dinner. We're raising money for the wrestling team at Yuma Catholic High School. I'm actually out here to do an annual raffle that helps to support Chase Stewart, who is my son. Hunting Dove is what got me started into shotgun shooting. He is an international skeet shooter who is vying for a spot on the USA National Shotgun Team. Because dove hunting in Yuma, Arizona, I might someday be going to the Olympics. After stopping and shopping at Sprague's, a lot of folks head on over to the banquet and raffle sponsored by the Yuma Valley Rod and Gun Club. All right, our winner! Winning prizes is exciting, but the real fun takes place in the morning. Here's a single right here. And I missed him twice. I got two. Hunting dove is great for beginners because there's lots of opportunities to shoot. You see, I just shot two times at a bird missed. I'm not really disappointed because I know I'll probably see about a hundred more birds. So if you have plenty of ammo, you get a lot of practice at it. Of course, everyone can benefit from a little practice. That should have been a dead bird. To me, dove hunting is just spectacular. The wing shooting is a lot of fun. It's challenging. And now it's even better. A new simplified license structure includes a very affordable $5 license for resident and non-resident kids. Plus, the daily bag limit was raised from 10 to 15 dove. That's five more chances to bag a bird with a bracelet, just like Jonathan did. Yeah, the little bands are individually numbered. Each year, thousands of morning dove are banded as part of a national project that helps wildlife managers track the birds and estimate their populations. I've been banning for Arizona for eight years. I've been coordinating the banning program for the last seven. Jonathan Odell uh, manages the program good. for Arizona Game and Fish, but this is the first banded bird he's shot. I really wanted to get one over time and, and finally have, so I'm just real excited about it. I thought we had a bird coming in. There's one right over your head. Another one right over your head. There's a perfect shot right here. <laughs> I need them right here. <laughs> no sun in my eyes, no other hunters. I like to shoot within like a 45 degree angle, so I make sure there's no one within those ranges. Every successful hunt starts with safety and courteous hunters who practice good stewardship help ensure a good time for all. Sun is really smoking bright now, huh? By mid-morning, it's getting pretty hot and the birds are few and far between. It's time to cool off in the hotel pool or maybe the Colorado River. Wow! However, if you're hungry, you might want to stop at one of the local restaurants that will transform your fresh dove into a delicious lunch. Thank you very much, ladies. For a donation, the members of this girls' soccer team will clean your birds and get them ready for the cooks at Cretines. Yeah, they're really, really tasty. You just don't want to overcook them. Now hopefully you saved your biggest bird for the annual Big Breast Contest at Sprague's. Oh yeah, that's a good one. So you're looking at 68.5, so that one's in the lead right now. This guy had the lead for a while, but the winning breast weighed in at just over 70 grams. Not quite ready to call it quits, we're back in the field for one last hunt. I wasn't even shooting at that bird, I was shooting at the front bird. Here he is. Nice. Oh, that's a collar dove too. When the sun disappears, opening day will be over. But anticipating the next opening day of dove season in Yuma will have only just begun. It's a tradition. Dove hunting, the September 1st holiday, getting together with friends and family, uh, enjoying some wing shooting and, and just spending time together. So would you like to paint or would you like me to paint? Sometimes painting wildlife literally means painting wildlife. These fur dyed numbers may not qualify as art, but they sure contribute to the art of wildlife conservation. They're part of a project conducted by the Arizona Game and Fish Department to reestablish colonies of black-tailed prairie dogs in southeastern Arizona. There's been a lot of conflict. Historically, there's always been a lot of conflict between prairie dogs and the ranching community. Many ranchers see the prairie dog as a pest that competes with cows for forage, a rodent whose burrows are injury hazards to horses and livestock. 
In the early 1900s, a government campaign to exterminate these chubby little rodents decimated populations across their range of central North America. Arizona was the only state to completely wipe them out. They were mostly extirpated by the 1920s and 30s, but the last one was seen in 1961 in Arizona. In 2008, Arizona Game and Fish began re-establishing colonies of black-tailed prairie dogs at the Las Cienegas National Conservation Area southeast of Tucson. On land managed by the BLM, the department built starter burrows and let the prairie dogs expand from there. We did another one in 2009 and a third colony in 2010. Every month, biologists and volunteers check on the colonies. Those numbers they paint on the prairie dogs help them identify them from a distance. But twice a year, they trap the prairie dogs to get a closer look. Last fall when we trapped, we had about 45 to 48 at each of them. All right, so we just need to pick everything up and head back down. They take all sorts of measurements. There they go. And then we're going from the very edge of the heel all the way out to that middle digit. And for total length, we're just adding the body length and tail, right? Correct. Yeah. This work benefits the entire ecosystem because prairie dogs are a keystone species, a critical part of this grassland habitat. Once you take that animal out of the system, the system will change in its absence. The digging and grass clipping they do produces soil rich in nutrients. Their burrows help rainwater soak into underground aquifers. They also make great homes for other wildlife. We have a lot of different reptiles and insects. There's burrowing owls, badgers will live down there. Prairie dogs are also an important prey species for a variety of animals, including the endangered black-footed ferret. So when you take out an animal that, that does so much, then yeah, you're, you do screw things up. Before these prairie dogs are returned to their burrows, they get a brand new paint job. It may not be museum quality, but it's definitely a masterpiece of wildlife conservation. Arizona is famous for its grand vistas, miles and miles of scenic beauty, But there's also a not-so-scenic side. Acres are littered with shot-up televisions, pieces of glass bottles, washing machines, cell phones, brass, and shotgun shells. These piles are called trigger trash. The biggest issues we have with this area um, were the increase of target shooters and uh, people coming out and shooting up the natural resources, including the saguaros and the Palo Verdes, and then not uh, hauling out their trash. It's been a huge problem for us. And with the volunteer project that we have going on today, it uh, helps us get the area picked up and get it looking nice again. Aside from tarnishing the beauty of the desert, opportunities such as recreational shooting can become prohibited when areas aren't maintained and taken care of. So it's really up to the public to get out there and take care of those lands they enjoy using. We probably have about 65 people that showed up today even in the threat of bad rain. Dusty Bun Shooting Club came up with a great idea to make the cleanups better, feasible, and not wear out our, our volunteers. And volunteers are very, very important for this. So, we came up with an idea with front loader tractors. We have vehicles you'll see running up and down that will make runs back and forth continuously so we don't wear out our volunteers. The volunteers bring the bags up to the road and we continually just have a running back and forth of vehicles picking up the litter and the bags that they fill so our volunteers can be more efficient and more condensed in certain areas and then we can move around like that which makes for a better and more efficient and less wear and tear and we limit it to only one or two vehicles because that again we don't want a lot of vehicles all over treading on the land and extra tracks and grooves and so on like that. Along with the Dusty Bunch Shooting Club, the cleanup was sponsored by Tread Lightly, the Bureau of Land Management and Arizona Game and Fish. While there is a wide variety of trash being collected, not all of it is going to stay trash. Everything that can be recycled will be. Last year there was a lot more big things. This year we're working on little stuff. Little stuff is a lot more tedious 
um, doesn't take up as much space, but is equally as important to clean up out of our desert. So we decided to focus on scrap metal, like shell casings, and things like satellite dishes that people are using for their target practice. I brought eight 95-gallon containers for scrap metal. I've got the back of my pickup truck and some room in our trailer, so we're hoping to at least get 20 cubic yards of scrap metal today. So the obvious question is, why do people trash the areas they love? I think it's just um, not realizing the consequences of their actions, but you have everyone out here today is most likely a target shooter, and so they're doing their part, and they're just working to you know, spread the message to other people that enjoy recreational shooting so that they can do the same. But getting people to change bad habits can be difficult, and land managers and wildlife officers can only do so much. That's where organizations like Tread Lightly can make a difference. In Arizona, we've got our Respected Access is Open Access campaign, and that's uh, really an effort to raise people's awareness to uh, trigger trash and litter out on our public lands and try to uh, take care of these lands so that we can continue to access them for opportunities like recreational shooting and whatever you choose to do when you get outdoors. Trigger trash is litter, and when you leave it behind, you trash the reputation of responsible hunters and shooters. Set an example and encourage others to protect public land. Remember the golden rule of outdoor recreation, Leave the wild places you visit the way you would like to find them. It was moving day at the Arizona Game and Fish Wildlife Center. At least it was for about 60 Sonoran Desert tortoises that were moving to new adoptive homes. Around 8.30, there was a huge pile of people outside the gate. And it, it made me really happy because those are the dedicated people that really want their tortoise. The prospective tortoise adopters, who were lined up before the facility opened, had applied online for adoption privileges ahead of time. They were also required to bring photos to show that their yard has proper tortoise habitat. Once the paperwork was cleared, they were allowed to come in and find the tortoise they felt was just right for their family. You peed in there, huh? We like him because he seems really active and very friendly. When I picked him up, he went right up onto my neck and was kind of pushing up against me, and we really like that. Yep, snuggle. He seems to have good personality and you know, be pretty active. When it comes to being active, with a tortoise that can be a relative term, but they certainly have no shortage of personality. I think tortoises just fascinate people. They're a little bit different than a dog or a cat, but they can still make a nice pet. They're low maintenance, and so when we put out uh, the information that we were looking for homes, we actually had a really good turnout of people that were interested in taking care of them. And I think, too, they're an iconic desert species that people here in Arizona really love. Oh my goodness, I love turtles. When we saw this on TV about adopting, I think I was probably your first application. <laughs> The tortoises up for adoption today range in age from six-month-old hatchlings to three-year-old youngsters to 50-year-old adults. Since tortoises can easily live for 100 years, anybody who adopts one needs to be ready for a very long commitment. We will have to make sure that he's inherited. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. So that he'll have a good home when we go. Huh. Well, I'm going to live 100 years. <laughs> The Wildlife Center holds adoption events like this because there are too many tortoises and not enough homes for them. The problem comes from captive tortoises being allowed to breed, and they can produce a lot of offspring in a short amount of time. Game and Fish frequently gets calls to come to someone's home and pick up 40 to 50 unwanted tortoises. Okay, you ready? Good Lord, you're going to need someone to carry it out. Before being put up for adoption, the tortoises are quarantined until they are given a health exam by one of the Wildlife Center's cooperating veterinarians. Once they are deemed healthy, they can be made available to the public. We can't let them back out into the desert because once the tortoise is captive, 
you have to keep them in captivity. If you put them out into the wild, two things. One is you can jeopardize the wild population by introducing diseases like upper respiratory diseases. And also for that tortoise, um, you think you're doing them a favor by releasing them into the wild, but that tortoise doesn't know where to find food, water, shelter, and often it can mean that the animal ends up dying because that's not habitat they're familiar with. They're just so cool. Before you think about adopting a tortoise, find out as much as you can about their care and habitat requirements. They will need an enclosed area in your yard free of potential hazards, such as a dog or a pool, and the area must include a burrow for the tortoise to escape Arizona's extreme temperatures. <laughs> this is Wyatt. He's got a great house. Our whole backyard is tortoise haven. He's gonna have his the greatest place. If you are willing to do the research and provide the right environment, tortoises can make a great addition to your family. They're really low maintenance, they're really easy to take care of, and they're great for kids because they come right up to you, they eat out of your hand. I just think they're awesome. He loves you. Well, that's our show. For more information on adopting a desert tortoise or anything else we covered in the show, visit our website at azgfd.gov. For all the fine folks at Arizona Game and Fish, I'm Jim Paxson. We'll see you next time.